So one response to the massive changes brought about by the shift to an industrialized market economy was to create utopian communities where people could separate themselves from the worst aspects of this brave new world. The most famous at the time, and arguably still, were the Shakers, who were famous for their excellent furniture, so you can't say that they really fully withdrew from the market system. Much more successful in the long run were the Latter-day Saints, also called Mormons, although at the time their ideas were so far out of the mainstream that they were persecuted and chased from New York all the way to Utah. So while some of these communities were based in religion, others were more worldly attempts to create new models of society, like Brook Farm. Founded in 1841 by a group of transcendentalists is a defendant clause that always ends in failure, Brook Farm tried to show that manual labor and intellectual engagement could be successfully mixed. Burr. Anyway, the most utopian of the utopian communities were set up at Utopia, Ohio and Modern Times, New York by Josiah Warren. Everything here was supposed to be totally unregulated and voluntary, including including marriage, which as you can imagine worked out brilliantly, but without any laws to regulate behavior, Warren's communities were individualism on steroids, so they collapsed spectacularly and quickly. But these utopian communities were relatively rare. Many more 19th century Americans participated in efforts to reform society rather than just withdraw from it. And behind most of those reform movements was religion, particularly a religious revival called the Second Great Awakening. This series of revival meetings reached their height in the 1820s and 1830s with Charles Grandison Finney's giant camp meetings in New York, and in a way, the Second Great Awakening made America a religious nation. The number of Christian ministers in the United States went from 2,000 in the 1770s to 40,000 by 1845. And Western New York was the center of this revivalism. That's where Joseph Smith had his revelations. It's also where John Humphrey Noyes founded his Oneida community, in which postmenopausal women introduced teenage boys to sex, and which eventually ceased being a religious community and evolved into way Wait for it one of the world's largest silverware companies. So yes, religious fervor burned so hot in upstate New York that it became known as the Burned Over District. And New York remains the heartland of conservative Christianity to this day. Or not. The Awakening stressed individual choice in salvation and a personal relationship with Jesus Christ, and it was deeply influenced by the market revolution. There are three points I want to make about the religious nature of all these 19th century reform movements. First, it was overwhelmingly Protestant. Like, all these new religions were Protestant denominations, which meant that they wouldn't have a lot of appeal to immigrants from Ireland and Germany who started to pour into the United States in the middle of the 19th century because A, those people were mostly Catholic, and B, reasons we'll get to momentarily. Secondly, many of these reformers believed in perfectionism, the idea that individuals and society were capable of unlimited improvement. And third, many of the reform movements were based ultimately on a different view of freedom than we might be used to. And this is really important to understand. For 19th century reformers, freedom was the opposite of being able to do whatever you wanted, which they associated with the word license. They believed that true freedom was like an internal phenomenon that came from self-discipline and the practice of self-control. Essentially, instead of being free to drink booze, you would be free from the temptation to drink booze. Members of the fastest growing Protestant denominations, like Methodists and Baptists, were taught that it wasn't enough to avoid sin themselves. They also needed to perfect their communities. And that leads us to America's great national nightmare. Temperance. And then we have the widespread construction of asylums and other homes for outcasts. The mid-19th century saw the growth of compulsory state-funded education in the United States. These new schools were called common schools, and education reformers like Horace Mann hoped that they would give poor students the moral character and body of knowledge to compete with upper-class kids. And that worked out great. Just look where we are on the Equality of Opportunity Index. Now this may seem like an obvious win for all involved, but many parents opposed common schools because they didn't want their kids getting moral instruction from the government. That said, by 1860, all northern states had established public schools, but they were far less common in the South, where the planter class was afraid of education falling into the wrong hands, like, for instance, those of poor whites, and especially slaves. Which brings us to abolition. Let's go to the thought bubble. Abolitionism was the biggest reform movement in the first half of the 19th century, probably because, sorry, alcohol and fast dancing, slavery was the worst. Radical abolitionism became a movement largely because it used the same mix of pamphleteering and charismatic speechifying that people saw in the preachers of the Second Great Awakening, which in turn brought religion and abolition together in the North, preaching a simple message. Slavery was a sin. By 1843, 100,000 Northerners were aligned with the American Anti-Slavery Society. Even Congress got in on the Let's Suppress Free Speech and the Press Act by adapting the gag rule in 1836. The gag rule prohibited members of Congress from even reading aloud or discussing calls for the emancipation of slaves. 
seriously. And you thought the filibuster was dysfunctional. The best known abolitionist was Frederick Douglass, a former slave whose life story was well known because he wrote the brilliant narrative of the life of Frederick Douglass, an American slave.